Oh my God. Hi everyone. Welcome to For Your Information number six. This is the sixth For Your Information that there has ever been. I'm Colin Knopfstrand. I am your host tonight and I am joined by my co-host, Mike. Is Mike here? Where's Mike? Mike is here. Hello, Colin. Thank hey, you Mike. for having me on For Your Information as a co-host with you of tonight. Course. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to our audience for being here. For Your Information is a show of four minute presentations by people who have niche knowledge in various things. Uh, we're gonna see some of those tonight by me, by Aaron Linker, Aaron Savory, Stevie. Uh, oh my God, Stevie, I did not ask you how to pronounce your last name. Stevie, are you? if you're there, please pop on the stream and tell me how to pronounce your last name. Great, we'll come back to them. Um, Landry Levine, Chris Chuini, Olivia Bryce, Hi. and- Hey, uh, you, you can just call me Stevie Lynn. You don't even- Great, Stevie Lynn is here. Um, oh, good. And Olivia Bryce and Kevin Ritter. Um, each of these presentations is gonna be four minutes or hopefully less, um, I'll, they'll be timed. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions for any of our presenters, feel free to ask them in the YouTube comments. The presenters will also be able to ask themselves questions. Mike and I will also be able to ask them questions. And, and we will. Um, there are, is a secret judge in our audience as well who has two secret categories that they are judging participants on. The participants do not know what those categories are, so they can't tailor their presentations to them. Um, I am obviously exempt um, as the host of the show from these categories. And then the secret prizes will be announced at the end of the show. And the, uh, the, the winners will then receive $10 each from me over Venmo. Very fun. Colin is exempt because they would win all of the secret prizes every time if they were not. That's um, not true. That's, they're just that's, that good. That's patently untrue. And you're about to see why in the first presentation of the night, which is mine, as always. Uh, we are going to be talking about South Atlantic hurricanes. Um, Landry, are you around? I am indeed. Awesome. Landry is going to be my timekeeper. I realize we should probably should have had you do this, Mike, but say la vie, it's going to be you. All right. That would have been a really good idea. Uh, next time. It's just always Landry. This is just like the, the thing Landry does. I'm going to stop my video here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Landry, are you feeling ready? Yes, I am. All right. Three, two, one. Let's go. All right. Tropical cyclones, which we in North America call hurricanes, are just a very particular, very spicy formation of wind and water. They generally require six conditions to form. One, they need sea surface temperatures to be at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit down to about 50 meters. Two, they require the troposphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere between the Earth's surface and the stratosphere to be humid, that is full of warm water vapor. Three, they need atmospheric instability, which means that air must be rising, either because of a differential in temperature or because of a landform such as a mountain forcing air upward. Four, they require low vertical wind shear, which is to say that wind speed and direction must not change greatly between altitudes. If the winds at 20,000 feet, for instance, are 30 knots north, and at 25,000 feet, they're 30 knots south, a cyclone shouldn't be able to form. Five, they need strong enough Coriolis forces to form and maintain the low pressure at the center of the storm, which in stronger storms can become the cyclone's eye. Coriolis forces, which exist because of the Earth's rotation, govern the angular momentum of air rushing towards the low pressure area at the center of the storm. Instead of all the air rushing directly into the center of the low pressure area, it begins to rotate around it maintaining the low and allowing cold air from above the troposphere to descend into the eye. Coriolis forces are stronger the further you are from the equator, which is why most tropical cyclo cyclones form them low to mid latitudes and why you'll never find a tropical cyclone crossing the equator. Finally, the sixth condition for formation is a pre-existing low level disturbance. There must already be a low pressure area to set the whole process off like the grain of sand that irritates the clam that forms the pearl. Now here's a map of every tropical cyclones track from 1985 to 2005. You'll notice that South America is almost entirely spared on both the Pacific and the Atlantic sides. We're going to look at the Eastern side at the Atlantic basin because cyclones here are rare, but not impossible. Well, actually scientists thought that South Atlantic tropical storms were impossible until 1991. Why? There are several reasons. One, the South Atlantic has a high degree of vertical wind shear, which tends to tear up cyclones that are quote unquote, trying to form. 
to the intertropical convergence zone, which is a ripe area for tropical cyclone formation, which is the area where the southeast and northeast trade winds meet, and which is also called the doldrums, only exists one to two degrees south of the equator, which doesn't offer enough Coriolis force for cyclogenesis. Third, sea surface temperatures tend to be cooler in the South Atlantic. In 1991, scientists tracked a tropical storm off the coast of Angola, the first to be identified in the South Atlantic basin. While it quickly dissipated, it proved wrong decades of established belief about the possibility of South Atlantic cyclones. Then in 2004, an honest to God category two level cyclone with an eyewall and everything formed and hit Brazil. The existence of the storm was a real Goldilocks event. It was allowed by warmer than average water temperatures at high enough latitudes, just the right humidity, wind shear and uncharacteristically low for that area. While the 2004 hurricane was the strongest yet recorded in the South Atlantic, Tropical storms have, have been observed roughly every other year since, most recently in January 2020. Two researchers forwarded over the satellite data available and determined that there have been anywhere from three to 19 tropical storms in the South Atlantic per decade since the 1950s that went unobserved, in part because they simply weren't expected. Do we expect to see more Atlantic cyclones in the future? Probably, but we can also find more in the past. Paleotempestology is the study of past tropical storms, which can be recorded in sediment levels that storms push ashore onto land or in oxygen isotope ratios in old trees or in caves. Little research has yet been conducted on the Atlantic coast of South America to look for traces of prehistoric storms, but as the methods for finding, identifying, and correlating storm proxies are refined, it's only a matter of time until we can look even further into the past before satellite images to get a hint of just how frequent these once thought impossible storms really are. Thank you. Stop Woo! 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 Truly excellent work, Colin. I have learned so much about hurricanes in these four short minutes. Yeah, the fun thing uh, about that one was that I feel like a lot of these I go into really being like, oh, this is a thing I already know a lot about. This one was a thing that I like really cared a lot about but didn't know shit about. And I think that shows. Um, we're going to jump right next into Aaron Linker's presentation. Uh, Aaron, are you there? I'm here. Awesome. Hello. Um, let's, uh, let's see what you got. Take it away. So today I will be talking about the female dick, uh, a, a dive into the intriguing world of the pseudophallus. Uh, this is a biological structure which we have discovered in at least 12 different animal species spanning mammals, birds, and insects. Uh, and if you're like most people, you're probably thinking, whoa, what did I get myself into here? Don't worry, this will be intriguing and it may help even dispel some myths on how evolution operates and how certain traits are selected for in natural selection. It is going to feature talk about genitalia and pictures. And if you'd rather not see that or hear about it, I totally get it. Feel free to pop out, pop back in in about four minutes when in no doubt someone more intelligent and more handsome than me is gonna be presenting. Okay, so without further ado, let's take a look at what we're dealing with here and really, really gird yourselves here. This is gonna be a real shock. Oh my goodness, it looks like a penis. Can you believe it? Uh, all right, everybody get out from under their desks now. It just looks like a penis, that's the point. Um, this is a female spotted hyena and you can see she's sporting a pseudo phallus. Uh, it's called a pseudo phallus because it doesn't function like a typical penis in that it can't transport sperm out of the body and into another because females don't produce sperm in general. Uh, in the case of mammals like our hyena here, typically the pseudo phallus is actually an engorged clitoris. As you can see, it's a really brilliant resemblance. Try to see if you can tell which one of these is the male and the female. I'll give you about 10 seconds to guess. Okay, time's up. Uh, it was female on the left, male on the right. Uh, if you couldn't get it, don't worry. Scientists literally have to sedate hyenas and then prod through their genitalia with tweezers to determine the sex. It is so incredibly difficult to tell them apart. Amazing. Um, hyena society is a dominant female society with a hierarchy. You have a highest ranking female, a second highest ranking female, and so on, and then the males at the bottom. Uh, and so all of hyena society is based around female choice. Um, one more wrinkle with the spotted hyenas, there are species of primates who as a display of aggression will develop an erection. They'll go up to another male and they'll wave it around, you know, it's basically to say I'm bigger than you, I'm, I'm more loaded, check it out, you don't stand a chance. Um, and so you might assume from that that uh, when a species of animal develops an erection outside of a sexual situation, it is only for uh, a display of aggression, not the case with the spotted hyena. In fact, uh, uh, when a male is terrified because a high-ranking female is bullying him and making his life miserable and taking his food, 
he develops an erection, not as an aggressive display, but as a submissive gesture, basically saying, hey, don't mess with me. I'm just a dude. I don't mean you any harm. You go worry about the other higher ranking females. Interestingly, we see the same thing among the females of the spotted hyenas. The pseudophallus will develop an erection as a means of submission. If a higher ranking female is coming down on a lower ranking female, harassing them, bullying them, the lower ranking female will develop an erection to say, don't worry about me. I'm just a guy. No worries. Um, very, very awesome animals. Okay, now I want to move on to the Neotrolga. Uh, trogla. This is a, a species of wood lice, which um, has genitalia, which is completely inverted. The male has a vagina and the female has a pseudophallus. Um, and the female uh, for copulation, there's a picture of the pseudophallus, beautiful, isn't it? And during copulation, the female will um, inject the male with their pseudophallus and they will extract sperm from the male uh, through the, the pseudophallus which I find very interesting. And finally, I wanna talk about the cassowary, which is a really, really beautiful bird, very big, very aggressive. Um, they've, hurt a, they've hurt a number of humans, but uh, killed very few except for a Florida man in 2019. Um, they also have pseudophalluses. There's a man for, uh, for scale. Uh, they also have pseudophalluses, but, they, but both uh, sexes have a pseudophallus, both the male and the female. Um, the males is uh, uh, used primarily to sort of invert the females and then allow the real uh, reproduction uh, genitalia, the cloaca, which is located below the base of the male phallus uh, to actually go about doing its business. Um, there it is in all its glory. Uh, and, and he's like, wow, I can't believe I have that. Uh, and there they are again. So what have we learned? The pseudophallus is a, a biological structure totally naturally evolved like every other natural structure, just another kind of evolutionary brilliance. And what we find is that no matter our expectations about how nature ought to be or should be, nature will always develop evolutionary advantages which subvert those expectations. Thank you very much. Amazing. Nice. You know, once again, I am adding to the list of reasons that I wish I were a cassowary. What are your other reasons, Mike? You know, those are, those are uh, really personal, actually. Uh, rather not get into that at, at this time. I feel like this is a fun thing I, I love about doing this show, uh, is that I feel like really, really anything that you can possibly like study or learn about, it's always like more interesting than you think. It's just like everything's so much weirder than everything's going to be exactly yeah you like read any read in depth about any historical event or like any like random animal and you're like oh shit there's like so much more going on here than i would have thought um and thank you thank you aaron for that presentation um up next we have our other aaron on the call uh spelled differently aaron are you here yes i am oh hell yeah functioning computer i love this Woo. There was oh quite some drama before the show about getting this computer working. So I'm really glad it is. Um, all right, let me just get you the timer ready here. You feeling ready, Aaron? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Three, two, one, here you go. Today, I am talking about one of my favorite and least favorite dog breeds, the Weimaraner. Um, in my time loving and hating wines, I've learned that they are a very divisive breed. Some people think that they're beautiful. Others think that they are weird and kind of stupid looking. Others find them scary. Depending on how old you are, you fir your first encounter with wines might have been as a kid or even a baby watching Sesame Street. From 1988 to about 97, uh, 98, Sesame Street aired a segment called Wegman Dogs, which was little skits dressing up William Wegman's famous dogs as people and acting out nursery rhymes. Um, William Wegman's photography is probably the most famous depiction of wines in media generally. Here is one of his most famous photographs of the Polaroids, 1989, um, with his dog Man Ray, which I think is kind of rude to the artist Man Ray. Um, Wegman said he loved working with wimes because they're bred to hunt, so they're excellent at freezing and pointing for prey. The reason I love wimes is because I grew up with one. His name was Fritz. He ate all of our shoes and everything in our house. <laughs> um, the reason I hate wimes has more to do with the people that they attract than the dogs themselves. I'm a member of several Weimaraner groups. Um, and let me tell you, the energy in those Facebook groups is wild. Um, most of them are lots of wime crimes. 
Wine writers have a long history of being pe uh, pedigreed and they're basically the Habsburgs of dog breeds. Notoriously anxious, they leave disastrous messes everywhere. Um, they also have a lot of genetic diseases and they're predisposed to bloating. So there's a lot of medical questions with close-up photos of dog infections. But the most bizarre part of the Wine Runner Facebook group is the aggressive obsession with pedigrees and purebreds. One time, someone actually posted a Visla in the Wine Runner group, and there were literally like 300 comments talking about how the Visla was absolutely not a Wine Runner because it was brown and it was different colored and that it wasn't a purebred wine. This guy was kicked out of the group. Every week, someone posts a suspiciously white or non pure wine. This obsession with purity really freaks me out because like, if this is their mentality, doesn't it like transfer to other parts of their lives? Like, where is this vitriol coming from? Um, so according to the American Kennel Club, that's the organization that registers and accredits purebred dogs, um, the wine writer must have a silver gray coat, a solid uh, color only exception of like white spots on their chests. Um, the only other question, uh, the only other color that they're allowed to have is a blue color, which is darker in hue. The blue wine is a controversial topic among wine writer circles and only recently was accepted into the AKC. It turns out this controversy over pure breed wines isn't new. It all started with a dog named Caesar von Geiberg. Caesar von Geiberg um, was the progenitor of blue wine writers. For a little backstory, the German Wine Writer Club was founded in uh, the 19th century to ensure, quote, the future of the breed. Membership into the club was highly restricted and only members of the club were allowed to breed warmer In 1947, there was an American named Captain Holt. He came to Germany searching for his perfect dog. He chose Caesar von Geiberg and uh, he got him registered with the American Kennel Club. The registration set off an outrage among the Weimaraner community and a smear campaign was launched against von Geiberg to discredit his legitimacy as a Weimaraner. Um, a prestigious breeder named William Carr released a public letter explaining that because the blue color is genetically dominant, it could wipe out the silver gray color in a matter of generations. And as a result, to protect the silver gray color would kill all blue puppies. Despite the hatred for blue wines, Caesar von Geiberg was accepted by the AKC and began the first breed of blue wine runners in the United States. Decades after von Geiberg's scandal, blue wines are still loved, are now finally loved and accepted as a part of the wine runner community. Let's hope maybe someday wines like Lucy and Vince will be too. Oh my gosh, that was so cute. Dogs. <laughs> dogs. I, I am I just always truly agog at just how, how the, the the passion with which people argue about dog breeds uh always always floors me. It is unbelievable to me. But I love I love finding out that there's like a niche community for every possible thing. It's deeply exciting. Um, up next, we have Stevie Lynn. Stevie, are you there? I am here. Hello. Hey, hey, welcome, welcome. What are you talking about today? Well, speaking of the Habsburgs, I am talking about Cece of Austria, who is my favorite drama empress. Amazing. All right. Three, two, one. Let's do it. All right. So I'm going to start you guys off with Cece's childhood, which we can kind of skip over. The only important thing is that her dad was kind of weird, really liked circuses and traveling around the country. This wouldn't be a problem, except that she inherited all of those traits. And then Franz Joseph fell in love with her. He was supposed to marry her sister, but when she showed up with her mom and sister, all in black because their nice gowns got lost, uh, Franz Joseph was like, wow, I'm in love with this goth girl. I've got to marry her. And his mom, who was known as the only man in the Hofburg, was like, wow, how did you grow a pair? I guess I will allow you to do this. So court life, mother-in-law kind of sucked. The mom-in-law, Princess Sophie of Bavaria, was kind of nuts, took all of Sophie's three uh, Cece's three kids and wouldn't even let Cece breastfeed. Um, Cece also received a burn book because it took her four tries to have a son. And she was told in this underlying text that was sent to her that the natural destiny of a queen is to give an heir and to do pretty much nothing else. Who sent that? Probably Sophie of Bavaria. 
So not a fan of court life, but she was really into forming political ties with Hungary. And in fact, setting up the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary, uh, which got her a lot of accusations that she was screwing the guy that she was making uh, those connections with. But she said, hey, husband, I will give you that fourth kid if you'll do this for me. So Austria-Hungary became a thing and then she fucked off to Hungary to raise her son there uh, and was pretty soon bored with that and decided to travel again and write emo poetry because her life was a prison, obviously. Uh, terrible life as an empress. So mostly she's remembered for her beauty uh, and mental health or like lack thereof. <laughs> I get you sis. Uh, her hair very long, her waist very tiny, like a 19.5 regular 16 inches in a corset. And that was after four kids. She pretty much just fasted all the time, like to eat raw veal squeezed through a cloth to make a soup. Um, one said that children are the curse of a woman for when they come, they drive away beauty, which is the best gift of the gods. Uh, also used to put veal on her skin for beauty. Um, so then her son dies in this very weird straight out of a Riverdale episode incident. He's like a 30 year old. His mistress is a teenager. His first mistress thought that he was kidding when he said he wanted to kill himself, but the younger mistress did not think he was kidding. So they're both found dead in his hunting cabin. And then guess who gets assassinated? Cece. By not accident, but definitely by happenstance, this guy who uh, with Luigi was looking for a different guy, a different person to kill, but he really wanted to kill a royal. So he's walking around thinking, who can I kill? Sees an article about Cece being in town. And he's like, yeah, that'll do. And lucky for him, she's walking around without an escort because she's such a rebel. So she's dead. She's stabbed to death. And then a hundred years later, this is where it gets really fun. This guy, Gerard Blanchard, is like, I want to make a name for myself. I'm done being just a petty criminal. I want to steal one of Cece's stars. She used to wear these really intense bejeweled stars in her very, very, very long hair that she used to learn languages while it was styled because it was so long. So he comes to the museum where her uh, star is kept, checks it out, uh, and then a night later parachutes onto the roof. Indiana Jones is the star with a replica and then comes back the next day to watch tourists gawk at the fake. He smuggles the real star back to Canada in his scuba, scuba gear, then becomes a criminal mastermind running heists across three continents, and of course gets caught. Because did you know that it's actually easier to get away with one bank robbery than multiple bank robberies? Fun fact in case you want to have a bank robbery. So he gets caught and he says, um, I've got some leverage. Do you want CC Star? And the police are like, Yes, please, please give us that. That's what they make movies about. And so he's like, cool, it's in a crawl space in my grandma's basement in Winnipeg. Let's go get it. And that is exactly 100 years after her death. The end. Oh my God. Woo! Oh my Woo! God. Woo! Jeez, I, uh, I, I, I really Woo. love the hustle of including a citations page in your full <laughs> II. It should be mandatory. Um, just going to put that out there. I think I did include Wikipedia, so it's like, you know. That's so valid. That's so valid. I wouldn't yeah. accept it, but I'm not in Yeah, college, but we so. accept it. We <laughs> accept it here at 4YI. Um, Stevie, thank you so much for that. Uh, who among thank us you. has not slathered veal upon their skin? Certainly, I have not done that oh i have all right um who do we have next on the docket why it's my friend and housemate landry levine hello also my friend and housemate landry levine landry welcome i'm i'm your housemate but not your friend uh oh. <laughs> oh, i'm kidding um <laughs> obviously thanks hello. for clarifying how's it going landry, uh doing all right landry um i feel like you're like what like five for five so far in presentations about like like left history uh in some way or maybe you're like four for four i don't know uh or do you have another like presentation about like socialist history for us today i don't but you'll be happy oh. to know that that it kind of is it kind of tangentially is Ooh. and i think you'll discover in like the very last moment of the presentation the way in which it tangentially is incredible um you want to you want to take us away here i do let's see here we go you can see okay looks incredible all right three two one let's do it Okay, thanks everyone for being here tonight. The topic I have for you is leap days, leap months, leap years. What's up with those? Um, so this much I'm guessing most people have a good sense of. We know that every few years we add one day, February 29th, in order to keep our calendar days affixed to the seasons. Uh, so our calendar must somehow be off from our rotations around the sun, right? So far, so good. 
But our calendar is only the most recent attempt at keeping time and the one we're most familiar with. Yesterday, I was fasting for Yom Kippur, which is an important Jewish holiday, and thinking about the fact that every year, the moon on Yom Kippur or any Jewish holiday looks the same. Uh, this is because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. This kind of calendar is used by Jews, Muslims, um, by ancient Greeks, Babylonians, and by the more well-known traditional Chinese calendar. It uh, kind of makes sense in a phenomenological way to track months by the lunar cycle. Uh, and that's exactly what these calendars do. Unlike our calendar, lunar calendars calculate their months by the cycle of the moon. So every month is about 29 days. With 12 months in a year, this means that uh, the Islamic calendar, for instance, has 355 days in a year, which is a notable difference from the approximately 365 days that it takes the Earth to finish an orbit around the sun. Uh, this can present a problem if you'd like your holidays to stay in approximately the same seasons, since the Earth's seasons depend on our relation to the sun. Calendars like the Hebrew calendar solve this by adding a leap month, according to the Metonic cycle. The Metonic cycle is in a, a period of approximately 19 years, after which the phases of the moon recur on the same day of the year. So we can calculate that since one trip around the sun is longer than 12 lunar months and shorter than 13 lunar months, if we add 12 years with 12 lunar months and seven years with 13 lunar months, we'll be able to keep the calendar mostly on track with the seasons. So the Babylonian and Hebrew calendars did this by adding an extra month in years 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, and 19 of the Metonic cycle. The Islamic calendar decides to just bite the bullet and let its holidays shift with the seasons. This is why Jewish holidays change days in our calendar every year, but stay in the same time of year. While Muslim holidays like Ramadan can happen any time of year and change over time. So like for Ramadan, in the winter, your fast is going to be a lot shorter than it is in the summer. Uh, of course, uh, because these details, uh, lunar calendars like Hebrew, Islamic, and Chinese calendars are often just used for holidays, while these, those societies would follow a solar calendar to track the agricultural season. Uh, and solar calendars, uh, it's supposed to be one full rotation around the sun, right? So our calendar is made up of 365 days. Uh, each of which is 24 hours. But there's a problem. One rotation called a tropical year takes about six hours longer than 365 days. So for many years, a solar calendar will very slowly shift away from the equinoxes. This adds up to a shift in one day every four years. So early on, uh, different calendar authorities would just add random days, but this was kind of annoying. So Julius Caesar instigated the Julian calendar. This was supposed to be a calendar that would just always be right. You wouldn't need to manually add days. So in 46 BC, Julius Caesar gets all the great minds together and they standardize the calendar. They set the months to be their current length and they set up a simple system that every three years, uh, there would be another, a fourth year that would have an extra day. So the average length of the year would be 365.25 days and it would be in line with the sun. And to get things started, they had to have the first year of the new calendar be 445 days so that it would realign the start of the calendar year with the start of the tropical year. But wait, what? why don't we still use the Julian calendar? Like, it seems like we would still be using that, right? It's, we have leap years every four years. Unfortunately, what we use now is the Gregorian calendar adopted in 1582. Uh, what they realized was that uh, even with the Julian reform, Every 400 years, the calendar was getting about three days off. Um, so by 1582, we were like 10 or 12 days off. And this was a big problem because Easter was supposed to be the same time uh, every year. It was supposed to be the same calendar dates so that all Christians could celebrate Easter at the same time. So Pope Gregory gets all the great minds together again, and they come up with a new system, which is that every four, every a year that's divisible by 100 uh, will actually not be a leap year, even when it should be, except for years divisible by 400. So 17, 18, and 1900 were not leap years. Typically, they would have been, but 2000 is a leap year. So every 400 years, you're able to make up uh, those three days. Um, and so they also, to make up for lost time, they move the calendar forward 10 days uh, which is why, um, so, so at that time, they move uh, the 4th of October, the next day becomes the 15th of October. And here's the connection I was telling you about. Uh, this is why Russia's October Revolution actually occurred on the 7th of November in the Gregorian calendar. Russia had not yet adopted 
the Gregorian calendar at that time. So it's the October Revolution, but it actually happened in November. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Damn. Thank you, Landry. Time is extremely fake. It's you. You did go a minute over, but luckily this was our leap minute, so luckily, it doesn't count. Time is fake. Um, and I didn't even get to tell you about, I, I did not include in my presentation, but there are very many other interesting calendars. There's a Persian calendar that does a very oh. similar thing. It's in, in Iran, they use this calendar. But um, yeah, calendars, weird shit. Well, if anyone has any questions for Landry, feel free to ask him as part of the Q&A portion, which will happen in just a couple of presentations here. Um, but up next, we have Chris Chouini. Chris, are you here? Oh, hi. Hello. Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. I am here indeed. What are you talking about today? Well, I just love to tell you. Let's get this going. Okay. Recently, uh, is the timer, what's going on with the timer? Is it happening? Uh, are you ready? Uh, I'm ready as I'll ever be. Let's do it. Three, two, one. Here we go. Okay. Uh, recently, my grandma moved out of a house in New Jersey, and as we were cleaning up and dividing up all the heirlooms, my sister and I both grabbed one of these Hamburglar Happy Meal glass cups from the 1970s. These were iconic to our childhood, drinking them at my grandma's house. And when I got it back to my apartment, I noticed that on the side it says 1977 McDonaldland Action Series. And so I wanted to take a little dive into the extended McDonaldland universe, and here we can see the cast of characters. There might be some you recognize. Of course, Ronald McDonald, um, Hamburglar, steals hamburgers, Mayor McCheese, who's got a cheeseburger for a head, right? Uh, Big Mac, who's the propaganda cheeseburger, and, uh, and Grimace, uh, who is this purple creature. And we all know and love Grimace, but that is not the Grimace that started in McDonald Land. That is a revised Grimace. So today I'd like to introduce us to the evil Grimace, the original Grimace. Uh, the original Grimace um, had four arms and used them to steal milkshakes. He was an antagonist in McDonald Land and he would, uh, I'm sorry, there's a cockroach right underneath me. Oh my God, and Aaron is terrified of cockroaches just trapped it, what a day. <laughs> Uh, sorry, back to Grimace here. Uh, he had four arms for stealing milkshakes and was an antagonist in uh, the McDonald land. Here we see a, a rhyming poem about him. The evil Grimace, Ronald knows, is round and purple and has big toes. He carries shakes in every hand as he scurries through McDonald land. This tells us what he looks like and what he does, but it doesn't answer the question, what is Grimace? Well, I'm happy to say that I found this tweet from McDonald's in 2012, which they clarified. Grimace is an, the embodiment of a milkshake, though others still insist he's a taste bud. I'm not sure how what I just saw is either of those things, but in any event, uh, let me show you a little bit more of the original Grimace. I don't know if this audio is gonna work. Because the evil Grimace grabbed all the cups. Where's the Coke? Where's the shakes? Uh, I'm not sure if you could hear that, but uh, he looks like a Lovecraftian nightmare, and he sounds like he's doing a bad um, Rodney Dangerfield impression. And uh, to no one's surprise, it, it didn't go over so well. Uh, young children were terrified, and there was also a lawsuit from the other children's show, HR Puff and Stuff, uh, because they said that they stole the character design for the uh, titular character, HR Puff and Stuff, who is also a mayor for um, the mayor in McDonald Land, and also this design of Seymour Spider for uh, uh, Grimace. Um, interesting collision, the actor, who voiced H.R. Puff and Stuff also voiced the original Grimace. Coincidence? I don't know. Uh, anyway, these are the characters of McDonald Land. Here you can see the revised Grimace, okay? Once they removed two of his arms and made him the lovable fuzzy pink gumdrop we all know and love today. Um, they also introduced the extended Grimace family. So here we can see Uncle O'Grimacy, uh, who comes every March for Shamrock Shakes. Uh, we can also see Aunt and Millie and Tilly, 
Uh, here's Grandma Winky. There's no photo of her. She was only referenced. But these are some comments I found on the uh, the um, McDonald's fan wiki. Uh, Winky, can I kiss you on mouth? No, you, but you can. I'll kiss you. Uh, and then here's King Ganga, who we think is the brother of Grimace and who's the king of all Grimaces. And uh, here's another very distressed comment from user Grimmer, Grimace is cool. Uh, so uh, I'd like to leave you with this clip in honor of the debate tonight. Together, Grimace, we could own this town. That is the president putting his arm around Grimace's shoulder in case the audio didn't work, saying... You and I, Grimace, we could own this town. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, truly harrowing dive into the history of Grimace. Yeah. Now you get the nightmares that I get every night. This is uh, Mike and 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 I and Landry and Elizabeth, who's uh, our other housemate. We're, we're all recently playing Candyland, but like the 1979 version of Candyland, which I feel like is conceptually very similar to like this sort of like mid McDonald's mythos, where there's just all these like characters and they all have like way too much backstory. Uh, and there's like some of them have been like excised from pre from like subsequent versions of the game because they were just like too hated or something. Like uh, Plumpy, the the last of the Plump Patrols. He's the one who's like the first one on the board who if you get that card, you have to like get sent all the way back to like the beginning of the board, basically. They wrote it out. Yeah. I love Grimace and I love evil Grimace even more. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, of course. Um, if anyone wants to participate in this show, we do this, uh, we do 4YI monthly. It's about every month, usually sometime during the last Colin, year. when's the next one? I don't actually know when the next one What's is. Thank the you date for asking. Time for the next 4YI. Time is probably 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central, 7 Mountain, 6 Coast, um, West Coast. Uh, date is unclear to me at this moment. Sometime in the middle of the week, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, even a Friday or a Monday, perhaps. Hey, uh, but this, this next 4YI, thank you for asking, is going to have a special theme. Um, the, the tank, which is hosting 4YI here, uh, is is doing uh, um, sort of a slate of political political related shows uh, of which we are taking part. So we are doing sort of a politics minded 4YI uh, for the next one. So if you or uh, any of your friends or enemies want to take part in the politics heavy 4YI, that'll be sometime in probably the last week of October, not on Halloween, but sometime before that um, next month. Uh, wow. So so is a uh, cute little like punny name for that one. Maybe combining for your information with politics? Is there not? It's okay if there's not. I thought maybe you'd have something for me. No, do you have something? It really sounds like you're setting it up for oh, soon. No, you I'm have not, something. I, have I can, I can oh. work on that. Okay, wow, wow. We uh, <laughs> really just threw both of us over the cliff and then said, <laughs> catch me. Um, great. Love to be here with you, Mike. Uh, mm. Up next, we, uh, oh, sorry. If you want to participate in that, um, uh, you can email me. My email address is Colin, C-O-L-L-I-N, at thetanknyc.org. I'll drop that in the YouTube comments here in a second, too. But up next, we have uh, Olivia Bryce, also my housemate and friend. Uh, how are you doing, Liv? I have to say I'm, like, dying, A, from the Grimace thing, because I have a really vivid memory of a Hamburglar movie involving them going to space from my childhood. So if anyone remembers that, please let me know. I would be interested in rewatching it. And then I'm so glad everyone gets to see the chaos that is just like your banter. Because it really is oh. like no other. Thank you. Liv, what are you talking about today? All righty. I'm talking about how the Instagram algorithm doesn't give a fuck about you. So okay. recently I've become kind of obsessed with the algorithm. Oh, sorry. Are you ready? Go for it. Okay, so I've been kind of obsessed because um, all of my friends' accounts haven't been posting. So I started this account, so please follow it. But my disclaimer up front is that I don't know anything about coding or computers, so that makes the understanding the algorithm really confusing, and I do believe they make it that way because they're a monster. Okay, so basically, what is an algorithm? An algorithm is a sequence of instructions that tells the computer what to do. And that can be as basic as a number generator or as advanced as animating a Pixar movie. 
But I think what's most important to remember about algorithms is that behind every algorithm is a human being or a team of human beings. And a lot of people who work with computers think it's very holier than thou, all logic, but really with machine learning, it comes to these machines internalizing the biases of the people who wrote the program. So let's talk about the Instagram algorithm specifically. I watched a presentation by Thomas Dimson, who was the lead tech, the tech lead for the feed ranking design. So in 2016, they shift from chronological in time to a ranked order system where this algorithm, this machine learning algorithm is going to figure out what you like, who you interact with, and kind of create your view from that. And the thing he said as to why we had this problem is because everyone is lazy and isn't willing to scroll through Instagram. And that the only way he saw outside of telling us to just, you know, follow less people is to violate your chronological norm, which is, I felt like just a, such a cis white man to like say, way to say that. Like he could have been a lot more gentler because he really likes nice ways of phrasing things. So that was 2016. You're wondering, did it work? Do we actually see these people we're supposed to care about more? And of course, my answer is fuck no, it's Instagram. So the algorithm is designed to benefit Instagram by keeping you coming back and keeping you on Instagram longer. So I would love to know, drop it in the chat, um, presenters and audience, which one of these quotes scares you the most? Because his whole presentation just made me see that the people who write these algorithms just see us as numbers. They don't actually give a fuck about what they're doing or how their work impacts humanity. So it's time to talk about shadow banning, which is when Content is strategically, like I say, diluted or downplayed in the algorithm. And at some point, it can even be completely banned from being showed on certain hashtags. And the key characteristic of shadow banning is that the affected accounts do not know that they're being shadow banned. Instagram says that shadow ban is not a thing. Literally, the CEO said this in February. But this is absolutely not true. Because Instagram has a new, very subtle way of shadow banning people where it hides things that it seems inappropriate but do not actually violate community guidelines, that's content that gets immediately blocked or taken down. Um, and they don't alert the users. And the only example they've given for inappropriate is sexually explicit. And the impact of this algorithm, the way they've set this up, is that it's disproportionately flagging and removing marginalized communities, especially bodies that are either hypersexualized or are deemed not to have a sexual value. So the salty story, salty I think is the best case of why this is truly problematic. I'm gonna read to you after I take a sip of water because I did hit my bowl. I'm gonna read to you a bit from their report, which I highly recommend reading. These are the images that got banned. In July 2019, a series of salty adverts featuring fully clothed, bi fully clothed BIPOC, disabled, plus-sized, and trans women were rejected by Instagram for promoting escorting services. Unable to rectify the problem via automated channels, we called this false flag the attention of our community, and as the press started to pay attention, Facebook reached out directly to rectify. After admitting these were falsely flagged, they reinstated the ad. Facebook publicly agreed to meet with Salty to discuss ways to make the policies more inclusive. We figured it was the beginning of a powerful conversation. In preparation for our meeting with the Facebook policy team, we collected data from our community to better tell the story of the way these algorithms affect us and formulate recommendations to make Facebook and Instagram a safer place for women, trans, and non-binary people. We released a survey on our website and encouraged our readers to submit their experiences of the way in which Instagram and Facebook reject ads, close down accounts, or delete posts. Unfortunately, over the past two months, this was like a year ago, uh, Facebook shows no indication that they plan or ever planned on actually meeting with us to discuss policy development. We believe the information included in this report is newsworthy and of public importance, and with the consent of the participants, we decided to make it available publicly. I could keep going if I did print out the findings, but I just wanna say, Clearly, Instagram is here to do what they think is valuable for them, what is going to sell content to their advertisers. And if your lifestyle or body does not match what you've trained the algorithm to say is appropriate, then you're not going to be seen. And 
Uh, send me your friends cool things on Instagram so I can support them and we can all fuck the algorithm together. Thank you. Woo! Hell yeah. <laughs> I love the four I I that's like also a call to action and this was that. Oh yeah. It was it's some wild shit and that's like the tip of the iceberg and shout out to Kevin for dropping a very cool exhibition on shadow banning in our group chat. Yeah, I'll drop it in the actual YouTube chat too. Oh, I don't have our someone can do it. I don't have it. <laughs> I will pass it to the YouTube chat for you again. Okay. Amazing. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Liv. Uh, I want to shout out before we get to you here, Kevin. Um, I just want to shout out our two folks who bought tickets at the $15 price point tonight. Um, that would be Elizabeth Sherbold and Kent Knopfschwin. Uh, a lot of that is my dad. So thanks, Kent. Um, we are always experimenting with ticket prices on this show. If you're right now, they're like $0 and $4 and $8 and $15. Next time, who knows what they'll be. Um, it's <laughs> just trying to find a thing that works. Um, Kevin, what are you talking about tonight? Um, yeah, I will be talking about um, Times Square and especially looking to kind of the development of costumed character zones. And oh I'm going to share my screen and we can do it now. OK. And I'm ready whenever you are. So three, two, one, go for it. OK. Um, so as I said, I'm going to be talking about the development of Times Square activity zones in, in 2016. But first, I'm going to run through some previous kind of crises and reformings of Times Square. Um, I want to start in Times Square in the 1970s when, as the city was facing a budgetary crisis, Times Square had become associated with vice as pornographic theaters and peep shows became prevalent in the neighborhood. Um, around this time and beyond, Times Square also does have this legacy of public protest, and we can read kind of everything about Times Square from a peep show to a protest to a costumed character as being related to spectacle. Um, in the early 1990s, however, um, efforts were made to regulate Times Square and make it more palatable to visitors from outside the city. Um, in 1991, the Times Square Business Improvement District was formed and by the next year, the 42nd Street Development Corporation developed new design guidelines for the neighborhood, which embraced the chaos, frenzy, and entertainment venues of Times Square, but notably kept sex out. In the mid-1990s, the Walt Disney Corporation bought theaters in Times Square to put on family-friendly entertainment. The process that Times Square went through during this time is often called Disneyfication, and this is both literal and code for a sanitized family-friendly spectacle. Essentially, Disney helped clean up Times Square to make stores, its stores and theaters more profitable. Um, moving forward, in 2006, Times Square went, underwent another transformation, this time aimed at making the area more friendly to pedestrians. The project for public spaces was brought in to deploy its placemaking strategies, including a pedestrianized plaza and movable cafe tables and chairs. In an effort to get people to spend more time in Times Square, which was notorious to New Yorkers as not a good place to hang out, PPS helped create distinct zones for different sorts of activities around the plaza. Um, these efforts were largely successful in getting people, at least tourists, to spend more time in the square. But Times Square's more chaotic elements, of course, were still present. Street performers, dancers, ticket hawkers, and unlicensed mascots remained an unavoidable part of Times Square. Um, the costume characters, which became more and more pervasive throughout the first two decades of the 21st century, um, uh, were increasingly thought of as problematic. The New York Post especially highlighted the ways that costumed characters would aggressively try to get large tips from tourists who took photos with them. The New York Times and New Yorker also published stories offering a peek behind the mask and into the lives of these workers who were often undocumented. 
Uh, but city officials also felt that something had to be done about these costumed characters. NYPD Commissioner Bill Bratton suggested that getting rid of the pedestrianized zones altogether um, would be the way to push the costumed characters out. De Blasio City Council and even the Actors' Equity Association demanded plans to rein in the allegedly out of control Elmos. As signs discouraging tipping were installed, the performers um, formed a quasi union to fight for their rights of free speech and against their lost wages. Um, in 2016, after a prolonged battle, the Department of Transportation and the Times Square Alliance implemented a plan to control the Elmos with what they called activity zones. Costumed characters would only be permitted to engage within a few areas in Times Square, and the Times Square Alliance insisted publicly that tipping the, cost the costumed performers was not required. Um, for the most part, the zones have been successful in containing the characters to specific parts of Times Square, though some news reports have observed otherwise. Um, but all in all, I would say that the costumed character zones represent that same sort of moral panic that led to the Disneyfication of Times Square in the 1990s, the impulse to sanitize and contain the other. Um, Times Square has always had this chaotic element and attempts have consistently been made to make the space more cohesive and legible and limiting performance to certain spaces and curbing free speech in the name of perceived safety. It's basically simply an extension of this same sort of surveillance logic. Um, there's a lot more to mine in this example in these questions of like free speech versus safety. And there's also a lot to mine in the way that the characters and the workers portraying them are racialized by the press. Um, but I am out of time. So thank you for watching. Woo, woo, woo. Hell yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Kevin. Oh, uh, truly fascinating stuff. It's the, the construction of Times Square over time is something that I think a lot of people in New York don't really consider. And it's nice to have a deep dive into that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I have a very different experience of Times Square than you do probably, Mike. I, as someone who moved here five years ago now, and you as someone who lived here all your life. Born in Times Square, actually, just right, right there in the middle of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, is it time for our q a i think it's time for our q a section uh do we have any questions either from any uh let's start do any of any performers have any questions for one another and the follow-up question will be uh do we have any um uh questions in the youtube chat mike i know you've been monitoring it a little bit yeah uh folks in the youtube chat any questions for our q a it's fine if no Meanwhile, I do have a question for Chris uh, about just the McDonald Land like expanded universe. Uh, if you're still with us, are you still with us, Chris? Well, this is just an open question for all the presenters. Then, uh, so a few years ago, we had a. Uh, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but they came out with like a sexier Hamburglar. I'm gonna. I'm gonna drop a link to a sexy hamburger in the chat. Hello, yeah, hi. Chris, what are your thoughts on, on sexy hamburger? Are you uh, still with us, Chris? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Well, this is just an open question for all today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, shit. So, a few years ago, we had a. Uh, I don't know if any. Wait, I miss a construct. It's delayed. Hello. Uh, I'm gonna screen well. share the handler, this hamburger that fucks real quick, <laughs> just so everyone can see it. <laughs> there he is, the hamburger who fucks. Deeply sexual hamburger. We should get our roommate that did the four yi on the sexy M and M to do a four yi on the sexy hamburger. We should. Sorry, I'm late to this. I think uh, sexy grimace is the next logical step. Mm. Would this be like a sexy human grimace or like still a monster, four arms, but sexy? 
I mean, I don't know what's not sexy about a four-armed monster, first Yeah, that's that's a lot more arms than most people have, which I love, frankly. Think of the implications. <laughs> Think about all the milkshakes it could grab. Uh, <laughs> that sounds... This scrimmage brings all the boys to the yard. That sounds yeah. like a natural progression in this... Po Um, do we have any other questions from any presenters or from the chat? Otherwise, it seems like our uh, our secret judge is um, ready to reveal. Well, I wanted to hear maybe from Landry about a favorite calendar that was not included in this presentation. Oh, that that really assumes that I know a lot more about calendars that aren't in this presentation. <laughs> um, I will mention that I find uh, there, there were two really interesting ones that I read about but didn't mention in uh, the presentation. One is the revised Julian calendar, which is not the Gregorian calendar. The revised Julian calendar like adds, like, like fixes the problem in a very, in, in like a slightly different way like the problem of being behind by three days every 400 years. Um, and the way in which it changes, it fixes it is like so slightly different that I think we won't have a day that's different in the, the Gregorian and the revised Julian until the year 2800. Because I think that's like the first year that's gonna be a leap year in one and not the other. So like by 2800, the revised Julian and the Gregorian are gonna get very fucked up uh, from each other by one day. Um, also interesting was the, the Iranian uh, uh, calendar that I mentioned, that's like a, a Persian calendar that basically does something pretty similar to the Gregorian, but has the added benefit of keeping the equinoxes more consistently on the same day by like changing what the first day of the year is going to be occasionally um, in a way that like keeps it from varying. Like it, it, it's, it's as tight as the Gregorian, but places greater emphasis on like keeping the like star positions and stuff the same um, as opposed to like other stuff. Um, so that was, that was pretty interesting. I had a question uh, just for, for a clarification question for Stevie, um, which was uh, your presentation ended with uh, our, our hero or, or our villain, I guess, um, being like, yeah, just go check my, my grandma's crawl space. Uh, what, was it actually there? It was indeed. He had stashed it in his grandmother's crawl space in her basement. Okay, because I feel like I had it in yeah. my head that he was like, yeah, go check my grandma's crawl space, wink, wink. And then he like slips out the back door while they're doing oh, that. Oh yeah, no, all completely true. It really was there. He really did do it. I mean, he, he's published a book at this point. He's he's like a modern uh, super villain for sure. He's, yeah, he's what we've got, <laughs> this Canadian. <laughs> Um, cool beans. Well, uh, I Rick I've got a question real quick, if we have a minute. Go for it. So this is about Aaron's presentation, but I feel like anyone might have the answer, which is when it comes to these like really intense dog breeds, like if they're bred to be like the Habsburgs of dogs, right? Like, how do you decide, like, like who, like, like, what's the list of dogs who's allowed to breed from each other in this breed? Like, like, how do you, how far back does it go, right? Like, like at one, at, at a certain point, these dogs presumably like were breeding with not dogs of their own breed. So like, at what point do they like really be like, no, that's the cutoff. Uh, uh, these dogs have been purebred for 200 years or whatever. I just like, guess I don't really understand how this works. I, so, um, uh, what was it? Caesar von Geiberg um, has a family lineage. There is like family tree, like doc, literal documents. The AKC does all of this. And basically, unless, like the only like, tr I think the only like pure breed breeds are ones that are like registered with the AKC. And they have genealogical family trees and like documents that like, like 
ensure that they like go back. And so like it, there's like different, so there's like the von Geiberg like wine lineage. And then I think besides that, like they do just come from like other dogs. So it's really much like other species. It really means nothing when you start getting into it. Documents. I just gotta say, I feel like the like white people who have these like pedigree things for their dogs and like eugenicists, like the Venn diagram is just a circle, I think. <laughs> like it's very crazy. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, uh, this is our uh, secret judge for the night, uh, Elizabeth. Um, Who would have guessed? Uh, secret, secret judge Elizabeth, Elizabeth what it's were real our... nepotism. I know. Picking me as your secret judge. Elizabeth is leaving for grad school very soon, so had to get in a secret judgeship now. Um, Elizabeth, what were our secret categories um, for tonight? Well, I just want to say I was my bit was going to be I brought the cat over here so that I could be like, oh wait, no, it's Miss O is the secret judge. But then Liv sent a like a message in the like performer chat being like shady about the cat and I swear to god like at the moment you sent that she got up but like she like saw the message and was like oh no mommy's mad <laughs> so I think that's hilarious Ooh. just wanted to share that with everyone your cat she can read she's very smart um so um yeah the two categories for tonight were uh, number one this will be it's just kind of a joke for people who've seen American Vandal but uh, number one is the Mr. Kraz Award um, for those who haven't seen American Vandal, Mr. Kraus is like a teacher who's trying to be really young and cool and hip and with it, like trying to really speak to the kids, but he's just a big, big dweeb. Uh, so the, the presentation that gave me the biggest Mr. Kraus energy, like a teacher who's really trying to like make this applicable to the kids, like really trying to win over the eighth graders. Kind of like youth pastor. Energy. Yeah, kind of youth pastor, but more like, I play guitar, man. Like this is cool. I mean, that is, I guess that is just yeah, youth yeah. Turn, pastors. Turns the chair around and sits on it. Right, right, right exactly. Um, so um, I decided that this award is going to go to Aaron L um, for your female penises presentation. Aaron, Who is Aaron that had to leave, I think? Aaron maybe? had to go uh, to be at a uh, Zoom musical rehearsal. Well, there we go. That's pretty big, cool teacher energy. <laughs> this teacher's also directing the musical. Sorry, guys. Gotta go Gotta to my direct the Zoom musical, musical rehearsal. Um, and then the second one is uh, the Dash Award, um, the fastest talker. And there's the cat in the background. Just chilling. Um, and the fastest talker uh, goes to Stevie. Thank Landry you. was a My close mom second. Be very proud. <laughs> no, I was gonna say Landry was a close second, but I think because you went over, I don't know if that counts. Yeah, it's stunning to me that no judges get to pick their own award categories, and it's stunning to me that in none of these, no judge has ever picked like shortest or longest, because I feel like those Boring. are very, very fun categories to do. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for being our secret judge. Um, Aaron L and Stevie, congratulations as our winners. Um, everyone else, congratulations. Thank you all for being here. Our audience, thank you so much for taking part in this uh, monthly ritual. Again, if you wanna get involved in the next one, um, hit me up, Colin at thetanknyc.org. Um, Mike, thank you so much for co-hosting with me this time. Mike, you are muted. Colin, thank you for having me. Uh, for your legislation, do you like it, do you hate it? That's something. We'll we'll we'll, work, we'll workshop it. <laughs> and uh, thank you from all of us to you, Colin, for hosting and creating the show. And I mean, thank you to I guess the Times Square Elmos that gave birth to you, Mike. <laughs> um, much love to you all. Have a great night. Uh, happy happy four Y I Eve, everybody. Bye. Bye. I can't find the, I forget how to leave Zoom. <laughs>